All right, everybody, everybody, come one, come all. It is time to start class. And today, we will be talking about financial and economic principles of sport management. I know, I need you guys to settle down because I know you cannot contain your excitement. So without further ado, we're going to jump into it. So why are we talking about this? Why do we as future sport managers need to know about financial and economic aspects of sport management? Well, as the slide shows, nowadays, sport is big money. So just talking about the big four, uh, you've got the N NBA uh, recently valued of the average player contract being at $5.15 million. And it goes all the way down to $1.9 million being the average player salary. You see... Uh, the winner of the FedEx Cup from the PGA uh, recently receives a $10 million bonus. Um, as you saw from the article on Forbes, the Dallas Cowboys took the top prize of the 2016 Most Valuable Franchise at over $4 billion with a B, meaning that according to the valuation, uh, the Cowboys' value uh, rose about 25% which is pretty unbelievable. And we see down the line here, uh, boxing and MMA getting into the act of Floyd Merriweather uh, made uh, $210 million in a single boxing match, and that's a mix of uh, contract negotiation and, uh, and rights uh, that he negotiated in there for his intellectual property and marketing, etc. And as you can see, just it's big business. And I would encourage you, all to also review the articles I have posted on Blackboard to help drive this point home that uh, it's not just a mom and pop uh, uh, field anymore. Uh, many years ago, sports um, of all shapes and sizes said that we are deserve special treatment because we are special. We offer you a unique product or service, but we're also just not in it for the money. We're in it to do it for the love of the game, but these dollar amounts really paint a different story. However, buyer beware, because not only is there big money in sports, but there's also big cost in sports. Um, recently, uh, Brazil invested close to $500 million for Olympic venues, and also uh, for the World Cup, they invested $1.1 billion into venues uh, as well. So it, between the two of them, you've got with ancillaries about two, $2 billion being invested uh, into hosting mega events. And the opportunity cost associated with those mega events was something that led to great strife within Brazil, which is a country now in recession and it has many, many problems. This led to protests and arrests and violence uh, in, in the streets. So uh, these reactions were, of course, as a result of, of protesting games. So it's, it's in addition, most recently, as you saw from the articles that uh, were assigned, the LA Raiders or Oakland Raiders or whatever iteration they are right now, they are looking for a new home. They are looking to sign an agreement with another city that will give them a bigger cut of the pie. And the Raiders are potentially dancing uh, with Las Vegas to create a potential marriage. And there is a, uh, a proposal out there that uh, to construct a $1.6 billion dome stadium in Las Vegas with about uh, a, a, a little uh, more than one-third going uh, being uh, public tax money. Um, we also had the Arizona Coyotes, a professional hockey franchise, suffer $30 million in annual operating losses as a result of their decision to leave uh, Metropolitan, uh, actually leave the heart of, of uh, Phoenix downtown and go to a uh, outskirt of town uh, and uh, build their arena there, uh, with, at, which, where they had a sweetheart deal. Um, and we'll get into that shortly. And as the ESPN article on the rising gap between the haves and have-nots of college athletics, uh, we're seeing that despite shrinking budgets, 
states and county uh, states and, and counties and municipalities are having to fund university athletic departments despite these shrinking budgets. So, in addition, as the business of, of athletics and professional sports have increased, we're also seeing that the money is greatly being increased in sport and uh, the broadcast of sport. So, recently, uh, a few years ago, the NCAA and CBS slash Turner Sports signed a $11 billion contract to broadcast March Madness over the next 14 years. Now, the, the rights deals to broadcast football is a little bit different. Uh, March Madness is negotiated with NCAA as a one entity, as a whole entity, whereas the media rights deals for football are, broad, or are uh, negotiated with each conference. So a couple of recent uh, negotiations that resulted in deals were the Big 12 negotiated a $2.6 billion uh, contract over 13 years to broadcast games uh, over a variety of networks, and the Big 10 very recently negotiated a $2.64 billion deal to uh, negotiate or to broadcast their games uh, over a six-year period, and that was thirty-one million dollars per school per year. So it's it's big business. So as you can see, the dollars and cents that go into sport are are are, are quite extravagant, and this is why we need to, as future sport managers, understand finance. And what really is finance here? Well, it focuses on two primary activities here. Uh, how organizations within sport generate various funds and how those funds are allocated and spent. So this is about budgeting. When you allocate, you budget. And the basics here are revenues and expenses. So revenue is anything that flows into the organization. So it could be a variety of sources such as ticketing, merchandise, sponsorships, service, advanced media. Um, it could be rentals. And then expenses are just anything that is spent on the operation of the organization. So it's flowing, it's money that's flowing out over the organization. So it could be the salaries of your employees or payment for utilities, or food, or travel, or insurance. So when the uh, professional sports team, um, or even the college sports team, pays the coach, that's an expenditure, that's an expense. And finance really is not about where the money flows here and there, but it's more about the decisionary process on how to maximize your, your cash flow, how to make sure that money is being spent smartly. So, um, revenue, uh, my, th th there's some basic formulas here. Uh, this is intuitive and it makes sense. Uh, profits or income, as the book mentions, are calculated by taking revenue and subtracting your expenses. So, whatever you bring in is subtracted, or it, you subtract your expenses from whatever you bring in, and that is your net profit. You could also have a net loss if your expenses are higher than your revenues, which is what's allegedly been happening in uh, Glendale, Arizona, where the Arizona Coyotes, a professional hockey team, have not been able to make enough money to pay for their costs, the players' salaries, the rent that they pay for the arena, travel costs, etc. Now, um, by increasing revenues and decreasing costs, of course, that's how you uh, increase your profit. So, an income statement is a, is a tool that's a summary of your revenues and your pro expenses and the profit over a period of time, usually what's called your fiscal year. And we'll talk about bonds shortly because bonds are common and popular within the realm of professional uh, sport because they're usually used to finance the building of new arenas. So bonds are a, are a tool that is used in the financial community that allows the borrower to borrow large amounts of 
cash over long periods of time. In fact, uh, some um, professional sports leagues like the NFL have their own pools uh, uh, bo- of, or their own bond pools where member franchises can take money out of that bond pool at very low interest rates and pay it back over time to pay for capital expenditures and building uh, building new uh, arenas and such. So additional terminology that's talked about in the book is assets. So assets, anything an organization is, owns uh, and it's trying to generate future revenue. So the facility itself that the organization plays in is an asset. Uh, the, if it owns a fleet of vehicles, that could be an asset. Um, intellectual property could also be an asset. Um, so the uh, let's say we're talking about the uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi Athletic Department, uh, the Islanders' uh, intellectual property that go with their nickname, uh, that could, that's an intang- intangible asset. Equity is the amount of money that is, um, is invested into the organization. So let's say that the ownership is still paying off money on assets like vehicles or, or property. Um, that is also looked at a greater amount of equity in a property because you're actually buying it. So the, the, more, the, gr- the greater the amount of money that the that in, uh, entity or an owner has invested in that firm or those assets, the greater equity that's in it. Uh, debt and liabilities is the amount of money that the entity borrows. Uh, entities are able to borrow uh, against collateral that they might have or future earnings or a variety of ways. And uh, they can do that to leverage um, to leverage their equity in the uh, property that they own and then try to finance at a lower rate. So uh, in terms of debts and liabilities, um, debt is the amount of money that the entity borrows. So the more money that they borrow that they don't own, that is looked at as debt. So um, when you're calculating how much debt an entity owns, you look at the principal, which is the amount of money that the entity originally borrowed. But then, of course, we borrow money uh, commercially from banks or private equity firms at a percent uh, rate plus the principal, which is that extra percent rate is called your interest. And you take your principal and your interest and you add that together and you get your debt. So, for example, let's say I borrow... A thousand dollars from a bank. That thousand dollars that I borrow is the principal. But in order to borrow that money, the bank is going to force me to pay interest. So let's say I'm paying at five percent interest on that thousand dollars. So they would take that thousand dollars and and over time, uh, you mo- multiply five percent from the thousand dollars, and I would have to pay that amount of money plus my principal, pay that off. Then balance, balance sheets list the assets, liabilities, and equity of the organization. And we've got an example here of Nike. So Nike, if we look at just Yahoo Finance here, exciting stuff. So this is your Nike's balance sheet, and we've got uh, from the fiscal year here, uh, May 31st of 2016 com- compared to um, May 31st of 15 and 14, etc., so everything here is in thousands. Um, so their cash on hand, you know what they have um, in, in terms of money they can that's liquid that they, they have in the bank or can access quickly. Um, they've got it looks like three point one billion dollars because uh, again we're in thousands already. Um, they've got short term investments, uh, money that they're uh, investing in. Um, they've got uh, they, we can jump down here. To current assets, so they've got fifteen billion dollars in assets, um, and then we've got other long-term assets. Long-term assets are assets that that cannot be liquidated. I think in less than um, a matter of months or up to a year. And so we've got uh, the, the equipment in the plant. We've got goodwill, which is an intangible sort of uh, notion that um, it, it's sort of the concept that the company. Uh, has name brand recognition within the public 
and that people think that their um, product is valuable. So we look at their total assets right here, and they've got $21 billion in change in assets. If you look, it's less than what they had in 2015, but more than what they had in 2014. Then current liabilities. Liabilities are, are what they have to pay. That's sort of their debts. So uh, we go down here, and they've got $9.1 billion in debts. And here's equity. So here's stock. Here's retained earnings that they're keeping and not distributing. Here is looks like capital surplus, so that could be money. And they've got about $11.8 million, $11 billion in assets. Fun stuff. I did it again. So again, assets minus liabilities equals equity. So $21 million in assets, $9 million in equity. So hopefully my math is right. It's $12 billion in, um, in equity. I'm sorry, um, $9 billion in liabilities. Okay, excited. So here's another example of looking at, re at revenues and expenses. So this is FIFA's annual report from 2015. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to take a look at FIFA. So we've got um, FIFA's revenues here. So it looks like they took in $1.1 billion in revenue. And the vast majority here is under um, FIFA's uh, event-related services, so broadcasting the games. You can see the World Cup is the lion's share uh, of, the, uh, of those rights. So they sold those rights for the 2018 World Cup. And then we go up, and we've got some licensing. We've got some currency gains. And we go down here to expenses, and they're, they got um, one point, or it looks like, uh, well, yeah, $1.2 million, I think, in, in uh, actually, one point. looks like uh, they've got quite similar um, expenses. So it looks like, looks like they uh, paid out that money. And you can take a look at this more. Okay. So if we're talking, uh, we, now that we know that um, sports is big business, and it, would, it may or may not surprise you to know that many of these organizations, whether it's the NCAA or college athletic departments or the NFL or the NBA, um, most of them are nonprofits. I believe actually the, the NFL just switched to being a for-profit, but many of, uh, if not all of the other professional sports leagues are nonprofits. And they are nonprofits, which means that no person owns them, but they can still make money. They just need to distribute it out to whoever, uh, whoever they pay services to. And college, uh, in colleges and universities can get creative in paying that out by paying that money out to um, other entities and the money that they would have raised would be uh, through different things such as uh, tickets through broadcast deals, through intellectual property and rights and sponsorships. And they pay that out to different associations, athletics associations, or development offices, or to other employees. And they can finance their different uh, programs through bonds. Remember, we were talking about bonds. So, for example, the University of Michigan recently went on a, um, another um, set of renovations of their athletic facilities. And they financed, they financed some of it through bonds. So, again, bonds are just financial instruments here that allow a borrower, the institution, to borrow um, lots of money for a long period of time at a low interest rate. Um, and so here you've got the key elements here of being the person who's borrowing the money is the bond issuer, and they issue bonds out to the lender who's letting the institution borrow that money, and they get a bond uh, in, in, in place for that money 
for a specific amount of money for with interest for a long period of time. And sometimes these bonds can be tax exempt bonds if it's if they're being issued by a governmental entity or municipal bonds if it's a municipality. And there's benefits because these in, these bonds hold lower interest rates because they don't have to pay tax. Uh, the bondholder doesn't have to pay tax, and it becomes more attractive. So um, there are different financing options uh, when we're talking about financing new facilities. So whether it's the University of Michigan or whether it's the University of Louisville or Texas A&M, Corpus Christi trying to uh, build more um, more buildings, uh, they're trying to gen- create more assets um, for their organization, or if it's you see the picture should look familiar, that's uh, a rendering of Las Vegas's potential New Dome Stadium um, that's being uh, that where proposals are being taken as to how new funds should be generated to pay for this facility. Of course, financing options include bonds. So again, long-term loans at lower interest rates. Taxation, so new taxes to be levied. So sin taxes uh, are a, is a um, type of tax where the government, whether it's, federal, it's a state or local, uh, tax goods or services that are generally thought of as bad for society. So cigarettes, alcohol, um, things of that nature, um, and the revenue that's generated through taxing things that we already think are, are bad in society go to helping to raise money for this public good. A hotel tax or a rental car tax, these are thought to be taxes levied on outside parties that are visiting the city and don't live there, and therefore the legislatures think that um, the actual citizens that live in that city are not the ones that are being having to pay for that funding or that that funding or sales tax or income or or, or some sort of other tax uh, that would be on any sales that's uh, that takes place in that county or state or organizations could look to traditional debt financing where it's just taking out a loan uh, from a, a commercial lender or a private equity firm, like it could be Chase, it could be investors, it could be Goldman Sachs, it could be any sort of financial institution where the borrowing party has to pay back the principal plus the interest at usually a higher interest rate than bonds. And then equity, using an organization's own money to invest in building that facility. So um, that would be, let's say, the Raiders, or we go back to, let's say, um, FIFA... Uh, has some whole, some um, some money, uh, some assets, um, short-term assets held in cash, and they want to build stadia stadiums that they own. Uh, they could take that money and actually invest in the construction costs, and that way they didn't have to pay the interest for taking out loans and not have to go through the hassle of issuing bonds or trying to get the government to work on a, a tax. Of course, pro teams have also been taken public. So uh, one uh, very um, Public example of a ta- uh, of uh, of um, a professional sports team being owned by the public is the uh, the Green Bay Packers. Other pr- uh, teams have been uh, taken public, um, or uh, but those are just some examples of different financing options. And with those different financing options, um, we kind of kind of come back to the central question of what you folks will be doing as future sport managers from a financial context is, and that's trying to maximize the value of the organization's assets. And those assets are not just um, not just equipment or facilities, but it's also people in different intellectual property. And what at the end of the day, you're really trying to increase the return on your investment. And you probably will be asking yourself, well, what is return of investment? And short, in short, it is the expected dollar value return on each investment that an organization makes based as a percentage of the original cost of each investment. So let's say that um, you have an ROI, a return on investment of 9%. That means that the organization would recover all of its initial investment plus 9% more, or it could be 100 
percent ROI. That would be a hundred percent. It would be the recovery of your initial investment plus a hundred percent. So to calculate ROI, you just um, find you try you find the initial cost of the investment, and then you are trying to um, estimate the magnitude that the investment will generate. And this is uh, often where the issue of risk comes up because um, an organization does not want to speculate on what the ROI would be and be wrong. So for for example here, we've got uh, from a Moneyball type of, uh, well, not really Moneyball, but from a financial standpoint, we've got Albert Pujols uh, in his uh, move to uh, be signed by the Angels, going from the Cardinals to the Angels. And he was paid $250 million back in 2012, which was looked at as an, an insane amount of money. But really what, what ended up happening here is they looked at the result, the return on that investment. So 1,500 season ticket packages were sold immediately after Pujol signed. And then later, not that long after, Fox Sports uh, television signed a three billion dollar deal with the Angels uh, for broadcast, and then the Angels' odds of winning the World Series went up to twelve to one, and then they eventually made the playoffs a couple of years later. And so you look at sort of quant- uh, quantified the financial benefit here, the percent uh, benefit here, and that would be your return on investment after you're able to recover your initial cost of that two hundred fifty million dollars plus uh, anything thereafter, and it's going to be a pretty sizable um, um, recovery. But like I said, you need to be aware, be aware when you're calculating ROI because uh, estimating and, pre- and predicting the future can be difficult. Um, so some issues that occur is that if, you, if it's a poor ROI or even worse, if there is a risk if, if a, a default occurs. And a default is a violation of the terms of whatever loan documents uh, the organization took out. So if you could violate the terms of your bond by not paying the bond, the principal back, plus the interest in a period of time, but you can also do that pretty much with uh, a loan document or any other investment document. And this is uh, really something that hasn't, it hasn't happened with the Arizona Coyotes yet, but they uh, made the decision to move out to uh, the outskirts of uh, Phoenix in an attempt to get a, a sweetheart deal for their facility that they played in. But they miscalculated because the fans really have not followed. So ticket sales are down, sponsors are down, revenues are down. And although they've got a, a good deal, um, they still cannot afford to play there because it's not making them enough money. So as we move away from sport econo- or sport finance and sport economics, one final thing here to note is that um, sport managers need to understand the basics of finance. What's, what is debt? What is equity? What is uh, income? Uh, how does a balance sheet work? And how do we protect, predict REI for a good investment? Um, sport managers need to understand these basic concepts and, and be financially literate from a basic standpoint because you will be coming in in contact with these uh, concepts when you work within any organization that's a business. So in terms of sport economics, that really refers to the climate in which sport organizations operate in. So um, it's surprising, but most if not all professional sport franchises, are monopolies. And that just means that they don't face any direct competition from other rival leagues. What is the competitor to the NFL nowadays or to the NBA? You can go down the line. And because there's no direct competition, this means that these organizations have greater bargaining power, which is where you see the situation of the... LA Raiders or the Raiders being being able to negotiate or l- try to look for a sweetheart deal with Las Vegas in an attempt to um, exert bargaining leverage on the city of Oakland to get a better deal from them 
or the Rams, who used to play in St. Louis and now are in Los Angeles, were trying to um, either negotiate a better deal with with uh, St. Louis or maybe even just go and get a a, a uh, find a fan base that would be willing to pay more 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 money to watch their games and support their teams. But this there's a greater bargaining power, and this leads to prices being artificially inflated uh, for their product. So historically speaking, sport monopolies did not exist. There were um, there were co- competitors. So the NFL had the World Football League. The NBA had the ABA. The NHL had the World Hockey Association. But either by virtue of those rival leagues failing because they could not um, uh, compete financially, or with the uh, World uh, Hockey Association, um, and I believe also the World Football League, those resulted in mergers. So um, this is, uh, we're living in a reality today where there are no competitors to professional sports in a traditional sense. Although the NFL and other professional sports leagues would argue that any sort of entertainment alternative to these games is a competitor, but I'm not quite sure if I buy that argument. So, again, like I alluded to before, uh, as sport managers, you need to have a basic understanding of the financial pr- financial principles um, that work uh, from uh, a financial function standpoint. So, having basic knowledge and understanding, as well as analytical tech uh, understanding and be able to perform basic analytical techniques is crucial. Um, Those who are interested in a career in sports should also have solid grounding in things like corporate finance or accounting, basic accounting, and know how to use spreadsheet software. Um, So being able to think like a finance person objectively and kind of understand the basic concepts of the uh, of finance will make you a more effective uh, sport manager. Although we've seen tremendous growth within the sport industry, we also should ask the question of whether or not this growth can be sustained. Um, we as consumers have limited income and therefore there is a finite amount uh, of growth that it can occur in these industries. Um, although Roger Goodell and other commissioners have set their sights high to grow revenues, um, we're seeing the average consumer being priced out, and now there's a movement towards corporate uh, entities and trying to maximize uh, the uh, finances with them. We're also seeing the dawn of a new age of advanced technology. So how can sport organizations leverage technology in a way that boosts their bottom line, more revenues coming in? Uh, How can more uh, potential revenue lines come in for, let's say, augmented reality or virtual reality or hosting um, other uh, events? We saw uh, recently a college football game uh, that was played uh, at a... uh, at a, uh, a NASCAR track, uh, motor speedway, and that was an innovative way to generate more money. So that's a generative idea. How can these new ideas spark new uh, revenue streams? And of course, no one wants to think about this, but how can, uh, how can organizations uh, prepare for the next economic uh, crash? So in terms of some challenges, um, how can these organizations um, guard against the, co- the rising cost of assets. Um, although there's been these, this tremendous revenue growth over the last 15 years, uh, and we've seen innovative uh, uh, strategies used for pricing and sponsorship and, and, uh, and um, other ways to uh, monetize a stadium and new ways to broadcast games, um, these new strategies do cost money to develop. Uh, so how do we limit the cost of these new assets? Um, so man, sport managers need to be cognizant of that. Um, 
the, econo the economic divide from a college standpoint is also very, very realistic. As the ESPN um, Outside the Lines investigation laid out, there is now a more pronounced economic divide between the haves and have-nots in college athletics than there's ever been before. And that really can hurt what's called competitive balance, where a sport's profitability is maximized when the consumer thinks that every team in that league has a chance to be successful, to win the game. But if the disparity is so uh, large that um, some teams will have no uh, chance whatsoever to win, that hurts competitive balance. Perhaps uh, instituting a salary cap in some uh, um, in some uh, sports or a hard salary cap for, let's say, with coaches or administrators in college athletics, that can be helpful in, 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 in um, putting a stop to the rising costs in some of these industries and maybe more in, in, in other uh, potential strategies like revenue sharing, increased revenue sharing, or uh, in, instituting luxury taxes can potentially also help. So... Um, so the takeaway message here is that sport managers need to be aware of the basic aspects of finance, but also need to be aware of the environment in which sport managers are going to be stepping into, where sometimes traditional um, rules of business apply, but also because many of these sports operate as an artificial monopoly or they uh, are operating with little competition, that also put, uh, turns the traditional aspects of business on their head. So with that being said, um, I want to uh, encourage you to get, feel free to reach out if you've got more questions about uh, either finance or economics of sport, and, and I hopefully uh, you've enjoyed this lecture. Thank you.